So hello everybody and welcome to Cricket Ireland's championing female leaders web series on the front foot. I'm Marie Crow from RTE Sport and this is our third installment of the series. This week we are going to explore allyship and collaboration and I'm delighted to say that once again we have a super panel. Um, Carl Lines is an experienced people development specialist guiding people and organisations through their own leadership journeys which is very important at the moment as well. Carl, Carl is also a recognised United Nations international expert in coaching, mentoring and leadership development and has worked with some of the biggest organisations in the world, FIFA, the FA and the FAI, to name but a few. So Carl is an expert in delivering leadership programmes and he set up Lycos in 2019 with a vision to guide people into brave new territories. Very good timing, I have to say, <laughs> from you, Carl. Then we also have Maeve Buckley, and she founded and operates the leading sports agency, building on a breadth of experience in local and international sports strategy, working with some of the most iconic sports brands, including the Ryder Cup, and it was supposed to be Ryder Cup week as well, so we're talking oh. about timing again, and FC Barcelona. Um, Maeve's speciality, our speciality subjects are women's performance sport, and Maeve is also on the board of the Federation of Irish Sport, a big day for the Federation today as well um, regarding funding and Maeve has worked with Cricket Ireland on um, strategy particularly around the female side of the game which is of course of great interest to us and Mary Walder will be a familiar face to sports fans anyway. Um, Mary is a multi-sport athlete and she plays cricket for Ireland and has represented Ireland at youth and senior football as well and um, Mary was appointed to the ICC development panel of umpires in 2019 and became the first woman and one of just eight women around the world to be appointed and she was the first woman to umpire a men's list a match in Ireland so uh, very impressive CV there from everybody. So for anyone that hasn't been on any of our uh, web seminars before what we do is we have a little chat um, together after the panelists have told them uh, told everybody a little bit about their journey and themselves and then we have a Q&A right at the end so if anybody has any questions make sure and get them in. So I am going to start with you Maeve because I see you there on my screen and um, you can just tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey. Yeah absolutely so um, I, as you mentioned, Marie, I have an agency at the moment called Leading Sport Agency, and I work a lot with governing bodies and international federations. Um, and my sort of personal background, I studied, um, you know, I, I always loved sport, but never competed to any particularly high level. But I, my journey started really through the sort of business side, and I studied um, business. I worked internationally. The business became sponsorship, which became sports sponsorship. And I, once I kind of got into that area, I found that I was really in the area that I love. And I worked agency side for quite a number of years. I worked in one agency and was very much given the opportunity by the, the man who owns that agency. And he believed in me and he was a man giving a woman an opportunity, but ultimately promoted me to CEO. And then I went out in a partnership with um, Dave McHugh and we had our own agency line up for it. And then from there, I now have my own agency. But you know, overall today we're going to be talking about collaboration and leadership and a lot of a career path, I think, is about who kind of gives you the brakes along the way and who trusts in you and who supports you and helps you. And I know we'll come back to it later, but I think a lot of my um, my work and my path has been about those people who've impacted me along the way as well. Yeah, well, I absolutely agree. And I, and I think it's it's the same in, in journalism and very important as well that you have somebody. So I would say, we'll take the red pen out to your work and, and actually take that time and sit down and go through what you've written and say, okay, this could be better. And, and those people aren't always there. And I think especially uh, now when everyone is so busy that it's, you know, it's not always easy to get somebody to take the time to be a mentor to you. But if you have someone, it's, uh, I think it's, the luckiest break that you'll ever get really because they will guide you along the way so much and I'm really looking forward to going through all that with you very very shortly. Carl. Oh Carl you're on mute. I'm going to unmute you. Oh you're still mute Carl. Can you hear me now? There we go yeah. The famous zoom problem being mute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah nice to meet everyone. Privilege to uh, to be here and hopefully uh, can contribute and, and learn at the same time. Um, so yeah, about 18 months ago, I decided to leave corporate world and set up my own uh, consultancy uh, called Lycos uh, People Development. Um, I was midway through training as a business psychologist and I thought it'd be a good time to focus on that. 
Um, so work with yeah, major organizations who really need some support about you know, galvanizing people behind a strategy or initiative. Um, most of my time now, actually, it's about probably about 80, 90% is spent with FIFA, with the women's football department. Uh, uh, absolutely brilliant. You know, real male dominated culture in, in football across the world. So there's a mission to try and change that and really empower more, more women and females into the game. So a brilliant organization to work for. Um, I do a bit of work with the military, a bit of work I've done with the United Nations and, uh, and other, um, other companies. So um, real kind of privilege to, to yeah, support people in different kind of industries and, and learn myself. Um, before that, I was at the English FA for five years, um, initially as in charge of children and young people, which is kind of where my passion originally lay, you know, supporting young people and then uh, in international relations. And before that, I worked in education, um, seven years in a, in a member organisation called Association of College Sports, um, who runs sport in England and Wales in colleges. Um, spent the last two years as chief exec there, which was a great experience. Very, very young chief exec at the time. Um, decided to have two kids at the same time because obviously kids make things easier, don't they? Um, so I've got yeah, two young daughters. And uh, yeah, I started my career in teaching. Um, particularly um, in difficult communities where there's, you know, real problems, social problems. And uh, that's probably where I'd like to go back to eventually, uh, working with young people again. Oh my God, it's, uh, it's been varied. You've, you've crammed a lot in already. So I look forward to going through that with you as well. Mary. Um, well, as you mentioned, I have played soccer. So I started playing soccer for Ireland when I was about 13. So right through the underage groups and I actually didn't start playing cricket until I was in my early 20s. So I was very much a late starter, but um, loved the game. So um, that took much, much over the rest of my life. Um, I played various other sports growing up, tried a bit of rugby, a bit of camogie, a bit of Gaelic, but soccer obviously took centre stage. Um, did was fortunate enough to um, be on scholarship in UCD and I did a season in America as well for soccer. Um, so that was that was brilliant. And I did my degree was in French and Italian. Um, and then obviously cricket took over. Um, I I started to go to Australia in the winter to just improve, obviously, just to fill in all the gaps that I'd missed as a child of cricket. So I started playing um, 12 months of the year. Um, I'm fortunate enough now to be on a two-day contract with Cricket Ireland. I was one of the first people to get one. So that was um, a privilege and an honour, obviously, to be paid to do what I love. Um, obviously, we'd love to see those progress in the years to come, but yeah, we'll, we start somewhere. Um, and then... When I was going back and forth to Australia, I started um, to umpire. Um, and um, it's a strange thing to fall in love with, but I really, really enjoy it. And um, I'm on the state panel here in South Australia and I'm on the, the almost the top level panel at home. Um, and obviously the ICC development panel, which gives me great opportunity to, to travel and umpire as well as travel and play, so. Right, well, you set the bar so high, you know, a total overachiever and everything that you, that you set your mind to. So I'd say there'll be uh, lots of interest in how you managed to do that and we'll go through it a little bit later. So um, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna start a, a panel discussion now. So if anybody has any questions that uh, you want to ask at the end, uh, make a note of them and you can put them into the little chat box and I will get to them. So I think, look, I'm gonna start off with it, the environments that we're in because I, I think they're so important. And when you see happy people and, and you know, I think that brings out uh, the success and, and the will to win and you know that contentment can help drive people on and and maybe when we look at trying to create these environments that do encourage success it's obviously not the easiest thing to do but like how how do you create these environments that bring the best out of people so i mean i'm looking at a sort of in an off the pitch environment let's say rather than on the pitch but in more of the let's say the administration side and that kind of side of leadership but a lot of it is about collaboration and you know making people feel comfortable making people feel valued within the within the team or within the project or you know whatever it is you're trying to to lead or achieve so it's about kind of building trust amongst each other I think is really important um, and letting people know that 
you know, the, the space is a safe space. So there might be feedback that is, um, you know, which you need to absorb and then change direction or whatever, but it's all given as in a sort of a trusted friend type environment. So for me, that's what building a sort of a collaborative leadership piece is about. Um, and there's an element, I suppose, of it being a sort of a social, there's, a, there's an element of a social piece to it as well, that there's a bit more engagement than it's being just workmates or people you work with. Um, that, that sense of trust is built through kind of building a connection with each other. And you can still be really diverse and diversity within it is good, but the trust piece is important. And I got, I'm sure Mary will have some really good examples more from leading it on the pitch team and uh, a team then who are going out to perform in a different way. But I suspect that that trust piece is a big part of it in that environment as well. Mary, listening to May there and just hearing the important elements that you need to, to create that environment, is that something, are they things you can relate to from a sports point of view? Yeah, for, for sure. And I think one thing she mentioned there was the trust. But for me, it, it stems and um, from building that environment with communication. Now, it's not, it's not the easiest thing to figure out as a human being because we all communicate differently. But, but someone, a coach, I see it obviously from mostly from a playing and a little bit of an admin point of view. But, but working that out, how people communicate is always an ongoing process. But once you're willing and open to learning how to communicate with people and adapting if, it's, if, you, if you know it's not the right way, I think that's the most important thing, um, certainly. And for me, as in any leadership position I've been, I, I did captain a lot of teams underage um, and I was vice captain of the um, senior team for cricket. It's a, it's a different, I mean, a different communication style for, for soccer. You're on the pitch 90 minutes and it's go, go, go cricket. You're, you're right there for, for the day and it's a different kind of tactical game depending on the situation. So at different times calls for different form of communication and it's no different to different people call for different types of communication. Carl, communication is actually something that I'm completely fascin fascinated by. And when I interview managers all the time, I find that a lot of the most successful ones are actually teachers, so that they have a huge amount of experience built up in, in communication. Our, our former Ireland rugby manager, Joe Smith, uh, a, a teacher, John Kiley, who managed the Limerick Hurlers to be uh, All-Ireland champions, a teacher, Pat Lamb, former Connacht manager, a teacher, just developing those communication skills. Obviously, the, the experience of being in front of kids all the time helps with that, but how can you build them up? Yeah, I'm I mean, it's a great point. And communication, like Mary has said, is, is really the foundation. Um, but I also like what, um, what Maeve said. Uh, what was going through my mind at the same time, actually, was about psychological safety. So we do a, a lot of focus on this within groups, which in a kind of non sciencey way of explaining it is, is everything that kind of Mary and Maeve have just said, which is about that you feel safe within a group, that you can say something and, you, and you're not going to be ridiculed um, or put down, you know, you can have a voice, um, that you, you feel secure with people, that you're valued and that there's some kind of mutual respect there. And so a lot of the work that we do, particularly internationally, when we bring, you know, 45 different people from 45 different countries together in some of the FIFA work, is really spends that first part establishing an environment which, which feels uh, safe. I think that's that's really key. And Carl, like you've worked with some of the the biggest organisations of the world in the world, is there differences to the environments that women thrive in compared to the environments that men thrive in? Yeah, I think yes and no. Um, I think all the organisations I, I work in are mixed, and I think that there was a I think a period over the last five years where there's been a real kind of battle of the sexes going on and particularly in society and in organisations. But I think the more progressive organisations now are starting to talk less about what's happened in the past and more towards the, the type of climate and the type of culture that they want to create. Um, so, you know, rather than talking about men like this and women like this, it's about how can we be partners in this process? How can we establish a really safe climate where everyone can contribute and it doesn't matter whether you're male or female, your ideas are really valued. And so I think for me, the whole concept of gender equality is trying to get away from men versus women towards actually, you know, what kind of environment do we want to be in right here, right now? 
maybe you obviously have a lot of experience as well in, in these different types of environments and you know you're been with some of the most elite brands in the in the whole world is that something that you find that we're kind of moving towards a situation where there is going to be unity in it and it is isn't a case where that men have to be treated differently to women in order to succeed um, I, I think that we probably are going to a place of unity i mean i think that there's been a need for um you know biases let's say towards encouraging greater quantities of women have senses and all of that, but the end goal, and I think the end goal might not be that far away, might be within a few years, is that that conversation has been put to bed, that it, it has become just a much more natural thing, as Carl said, that, you know, that that, that conversation is almost over now. Like, it, it's interesting, I had a conversation with Una May in Sport Ireland this morning about something to do with gender as well, and she made a very good point, which I agree with, is that, you know, we need to be conscious of all diversity as well. And I think if we just end up talking about men and women, we can forget about, you know, there's a, there's a need for diversity in general uh, in order to create better decision making. You know, generally, um, the broader the range of opinions that are there, the types of people, probably the better outcome in terms of the decision made at the end of the day. So um, it would be great to think that within a few years, we'll have gotten to a space where the kind of gender we've moved on a bit from the gender question but we we need to be conscious as well of that sort of broader diversity question and that we're we address that as part of it as well yeah i don't think anyone will, will disagree with that and it does yeah feel we are on the start of, of that journey we're probably a little bit further down the road and mary when you think of sport and and what happens on the field i think when you look at the likes of arsenal and they're dropping the arsenal women and it's just arsenal or even shelburne here at home the, the women's team are they're just shelburne they're all part of the one club that looks like absolutely fantastic progress but then on the other side of that you have the issue with canterbury not making the ireland women's rugby jerseys or you know you have the matildas as well in, in australia and you couldn't get the away strip for the women so it feels like it's almost a seesaw you know a couple of steps forward and a couple of steps back and, and it feels like a little bit of a battle still um, yeah, it's a, for sure a battle. Um, I will say press release here now is the Matilda's jersey will be available in January 2021. It was just on Twitter earlier. So, I mean, that just shows you the power of um, social media for women um, and women's sport in particular. There was enough um, fuss kicked up there in a few days and, and they changed their mind and rightly so. But absolutely, um, what you say, it's kind of it's give it one hand and take with the other. Um, and I know the guys had mentioned there we're we're almost there in terms of equality and but what I feel is holding us back is a little bit what was mentioned last week is like the the language used and stuff. So you can go as far and say, yeah, we're we're doing this, but um as a woman and if you just hear man or him and that and that constant, okay, there might be trying to create an environment where it's equal, but you're not hearing that. So it's until you hear and feel like you're equal, you you know, there there'll still be those frustrations. Um visible and, and it's hard to go around and, and do your you know your your daily business or whatever you need to do because you're constantly hearing that you're you're not actually equal but when you look at when you started and and you know where you are now and, and what i mean when you started from like being as an adult and, and the journey that you've been on as a sportswoman mary like has there been progress made or are we just kind of trying to almost put a positive spin on it um there, look, there has been progress made, um, loads and loads of progress, absolutely. Do do people and organisations shoot themselves in the foot all the time? Yes, they do. But if, if you look at um, how many sports are professional or semi-professional or the likes of the GAA and Lidl and that backing, um, it's it's been brilliant to see and just evolve. And I think social media has a huge part to play in that because it, it's accessible to everybody. Um, I've never had to, I've been fortunate enough, even since I was um, younger, I've never had to pay to go away on an international trip. I've had to pay and I backpacked to go and play in the Champions League, which obviously if I was a man would never happen. And that's crazy. Um, but things definitely have got better. There is so much more to go without sounding like Fianna Fáil. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, definitely. Like, I mean, I'm, you know, 20 years plus playing um playing at a high level and yeah it's definitely gone a long long way that's mary's taken it from a from an athlete's point of view made from a, a sponsorship 
point of view, which is we've seen, I think, over the last few years, as progress has started to be made, that it is hugely important that women does um, do have sponsors. We've seen the value of, of Lidl, as um, Mary mentioned there, two ladies football. Are brands getting on board now with women's sport? And, and is there longevity there, do you think? I think brands are definitely getting on board with women's sport. I suspect that there probably is a bit of a thing where they'll come in and plant lowballing it to an extent that they wouldn't with maybe the men's version of the game or um and you know this I suppose from maybe the brand's perspective they might just try that by saying they're taking a bit of a punch or some value still needs to be created of you know games being played around that area but um, but some brands and like Liberty Insurance, they're legal, there are a number of them who've really gone out on the front foot about it and have done really well around it. Um, and then I think there are other sports and other areas that still remain a little bit untapped um, and could do quite a bit more. I think the 20 by 20 campaign has been very significant actually in just pushing forward the mindset in this country. And even, even thinking back, three or four years ago, if you could, we could put ourselves back into shoes, but then we've actually, we started to move on in big leaps and bounds, which I think is really helpful. So I agree with Mary, we still have a long way to go, but it feels like the speed with which we're moving every year is getting faster, if that makes sense. Carl, at the same time, we're kind of almost bracing ourselves as we head into the unknown, and it does feel like, you know, this is going to be a very challenging period for not just men's sport, or women's sport, but just all sport really, and, and, and activity as well. And like, how big do you think the challenge is going to be? Yeah, it's huge. I mean, we're, we're in the middle of a public health crisis, uh, economic crisis, social crisis. So hugely disruptive time at the moment. And, um, you know, change is never uniform, is it? it? You know, we don't all go forwards at the same time. There'll be, like Mary said, some environments might move forward and others might you know, have the status quo or actually move backwards. And we have to acknowledge where there are difficulties and also acknowledge where there's some real great spotlights, which we want to shine brightly on to show everyone a new way of doing things. Um, but, you know, what we need in times of disruption is a good balance of some harmony. So leaders who can kind of bring us together and, and create some unity, in, in particularly in terms of vision. But also, you know, there's a, there's a wave that's moving and, um, as the ground's kind of moving, it, it, it's a great time to say, look, let, let's lock down right now what we want to keep and capture that, you know, all the progress that's been made. But also at the same time, now's the time to, to change things and create a, a new kind of organisations, new teams, new society, um, which is different from what it, where it was before. And, and let's not lose this kind of disruptive time and the opportunity that it, that it presents. Maybe it is really a case of where it's going to be trying, everyone's going to have to try and work together to keep pushing the wave and the visibility and the push on, I was going to say attendances, but I think that's out the window for the yeah. moment, but it, the, the push on participation and, and just even the interest and seeing our role models and seeing the, the women on the TV and picking up the paper and, and being able to, to read match reports. And, and they're only small things, but they can all start to slip away very, very quickly. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think as well, what's important is, you know, the likes of, let's say, Mary is an umpire. So seeing people not just um, at the athletes, but seeing them in the umpire roles, the refing roles, the TV refs, your role, Marie, seeing what, you know, sports journalists, like I think back five, 10 years ago, there were very few females and now it's totally normal almost I would say so you know seeing them in the administration side and the governance side so seeing more female presence across all areas and ironically I actually think from a sort of an administration point of view there could be an opportunity within this pandemic for females so use the example let's say to be a female on a board up until last year it might have meant that to go to your board meeting once a month meant driving for two hours and then three hours there, two hours back. And you just couldn't do that on a Wednesday because your kids need to go to practice and you've got other obligations. Whereas possibly without the pandemic, you're going to be sitting doing your board meeting like this to Zoom. And actually you can do it on a Wednesday evening because simultaneously your children can use the stairs but it, it, or whatever, but it opens up that opportunity to 
possibly on that administration governance side that wasn't there before. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. I have two sisters who are going back to college because they don't have to go in now. So they have kids and they're going, I can just do the, the courses online and they would have been able to do that before. So there is yeah. know, opportunities. But maybe what I love about your story is that, you know, from the outset, you said you weren't playing sports when you were younger. And a lot of that, like a lot of the time I found when I was growing up that people that didn't play sport thought that sport wasn't for them. And it was something that they parked. So I love to see people who didn't play sport, maybe they just didn't want to play, didn't like to play, but we're still into it, pursuing careers in sports, whether it's sponsorship, whether it's governance. And like that is also, I think, a really important part of growing women's sport. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, like when I was younger, quite a long time ago now, but there were less, you know, there were certain sports you could compete in as a female or a girl or whatever, you know, but there were, there were much less. Um, and like rowing is an example, you know, my family was went into rowing and, you know, I used to, you know, with my dad and he was coaching, but I'd kind of cycle with them, but unless you were going to be the cop or something, there weren't really that many opportunities for girls to row, and now it's possibly slightly more girls and boys, you know, so the world has changed a lot in that 30 years or whatever it is, but, um, and that's all for the better, the, the opportunities are far greater there, and then, I thought your question as well was the, opportunity for people to see themselves working in the area without having necessarily been the athletes within the area and there are many more paths into it now you don't you know which is fantastic as well that, and then again that allows for greater diversity of thinking and greater experience. Carl that's the crucial point isn't it that there are now more pathways for women in sport to, to get into all these different roles. Yeah absolutely um, I mean what the question you mentioned before about differences between men and women, I've just done a piece of research actually um, about gender differences in, in terms of kind of neuroscience. And it, and it comes back really compelling that, you know, there's no evidence or consensus that either men or women make better decisions. Um, you know, absolutely not. So capability isn't a difference. Um, motivation isn't a difference. But it has to be then opportunity. Um, and that's where there's a massive difference between men and women in, in terms of pathways, like you said, in terms of getting into industries, but also once you're in an organisation or an industry, being able to progress. And, and that's where organisations have to do a lot better um, about creating internal pathways to allow women to, to be able to progress internally and particularly into, into decision making roles. And um, if ever there's uh, a place where a focus should be that would be a really good starting point like we are on a, a journey Carl there, there's no denying that and, and there is progress being made and, and you know that's measurable in, in some of the ways that Mary um, outlined a little bit er earlier but trying to maintain the path that we're on now how do we do that yeah um I'm not sure I've got an easy kind of answer to that question and I wouldn't want to kind of simplify it too much because I'm not sure it's actually one thing. Um, I think recognising where progress has been made is a really great starting point. Um, like, like, you know, like we said before, so that we can build on that. I think we have to recognise, given the current situation, that, that some things are going to go backwards. Um, you know, organisations are making massive cuts and uh, to their workforce and that's going to have a, a kind of an impact and so we won't see what the full impact of that is right now it will take some effect over the kind of course of the next year to 18 months so um i think where our focus probably should be is making sure that those who are most marginalized and vulnerable at the moment um should be really kind of looked after and and we we spend some time really engaging with those people to ensure we find out what the real issues are on the ground um, and, and try and involve people in being part of part of the solution. And rather than people like me saying, this is what the problem is and this is how we should do it, actually, we should hear from real people on the ground to find out you know, what's going through people's minds at the moment and how can we empower people, people to be part of creating um, you know, the change post COVID. 
But we have um, Mary there beside you, who is one of the people who is uh, in the middle and, and helping drive the change and, you know, being an athlete and, and, and breaking ground as an umpire. Mary, if we want to keep progressing and, you know, get to a stage where you achieving what you did wasn't news because it was normal or Joy Neville becoming a referee in the men's game isn't, uh, isn't a news story anymore because there's plenty of people doing it. What do we need to do to, to keep building on this success and, you know, that keep making it a, a thing where there are glass ceilings being shattered? Um, well, one thing, so I just related a little bit to the last conversation um, to help the drive going forward, and I it was it was mentioned in another one of the chats, but the um, Sport Ireland COVID relief package, part of that it was you had to um, apply for your women or have your women involved as well as your ma men, men's teams, and I think going forward, any funding that comes out of Sport Ireland, any application that comes in, it should be... Um, be going to equally men and women and i think that's something simple that can that can help going forward they, they, you're not getting any funding if you're not including your women and i think that's probably perfectly fair and perfectly right um we do make up quite a lot of the population and need to be active in sport as well so i think that's just a starting point and i know that's been brought up many many times and it's great to see actually that this is coming through at the minute um just in the in the specifically in the covid relief i'm not sure outside of that um, but again, it's just that, like the, the fact that um, 2020, as Maeve mentioned, is a, was a brilliant um, initiative and we just need to keep keep that drive on with, with social media. Um, social media is one way just because it's accessible and look, it's not it's not free. Anyone who runs an account puts a lot, a lot of time into it, but it's, you know, it seems easy and free and to get that across. So I think that's one thing we can keep backing ourselves. And also, I mean, I, I know I said this is somebody recently, but I, I don't really see myself as a role model, although you know, we've listed out the things and I, I clearly am and, and Joy for me is a massive role model and it's amazing she's Irish and I can look up to her. But it's actually kind of giving us that um, empowerment and beliefs, our, belief in ourselves to kind of spread our own message as well and, and just be a little bit out, more out there and be comfortable um, spreading our own our own message, our own news and that kind of thing. So, yeah, but yeah, the funding, funding for me is, is crucial. <laughs> Maybe you might have a view on the funding. Well, I mean, just one thing I would say is I think it's really important to kind of call out bias when you see it. So, like, I just told Mary for just saying now, okay, well, this is something that I'm going to call out because, you know, I think just right now, and I think on the, you mentioned the Jersey, the Canterbury Jersey, um, women, just immediately a lot of people called it out and Canterbury is the statement, and people called out that statement, and it also it was changed. So I think, I think it's really important, and that's where social media probably has quite a useful role as well, and that people's voices can get amplified. Um, I mean, on the funding thing, that has certainly been successful in other countries and New Zealand, and I think in many cases in certain sports in Australia as well, they've done that, that they've, you know, they've brought themselves to the point, and maybe they've given sports or particularly at the club level a couple of years, but they've said, you know, by this year, you do need to be at this point or your funding will be had or cease or will change or whatever. So. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be against that either, to be honest. I think it's, it's proven to be effective in other countries. And what about the governing bodies? And I'm talking about the, the major governing bodies here in the, in, in the country. Maybe, are they doing enough to, to create an equal environment for their men's and women's teams, do you think? I know it's hard to, to, to generalise, but, like, you know, we, when we're looking at and making progress, we often call out sponsors and say that, you know, that they're missing out by not being involved. But are the governing bodies missing, out, missing a trick a little bit as well, that they're not supporting their women enough? You mean the women on the pitch rather yep. than like the actual athletes? Um, so obviously there are examples, you know, there's a kind of a broad range of examples here and there are some sports that say that are naturally a bit more uh, gender balanced anyway because the type of sport it is, so like maybe a, a rowing or a hockey or whatever, just the demographic of it. I think for the sports that were typically male dominated, they have come a long way. So I will say that they've come a long way in what they've done in the, over the last few years and I would say more or less they all have still some road to go mm -hmm. you know so uh, but I think they've all recognized this and they're all on the right track and they're doing have done a lot and continue to do a lot to push that forward and um, but are we at the stage you know with any of our big sports that were previously male dominated where we're at a, 
an Australia example where they're on equal pay and stuff, we're not, we're not there yet. Yeah, well, there was a lot of calling out done, I think, over the last few years, and it was necessary calling out, and um, hopefully that will continue because, it, you know, as you said, Maeve, it, it really does bring about change. And, and look, we mentioned at the start of the of the conversation about mentorship and um, the importance of it and, and the benefits of it, and, and maybe that was something that I know you wanted to, to touch on and how it can help to bring women forward and to help them succeed as well. Yeah. Like, because I, I think what, you know, has been the case in the past is to, you know, to get forward, you build relationships maybe with people ahead of you. And naturally, it's probably easier to build relationships with people where you are like you or you are like them or whatever. And so that has tended to maybe perpetuate a bias because there were younger men coming through who would ally with older men or whatever. And I think there have been very positive examples now, and you know, Carl has mentioned this as well, of and it's happened in my case where there have been really good men along the way who mentored me and mentored me in a very gender neutral sort of way so you know given constructive criticism when it was needed or positive support when it was needed in other ways and given me the opportunity to break and I think it kind of behoves all of us and people like me now who've gotten to a certain stage that I, I dedicate a percentage of my time just to make sure I'm available to people and available to give back and support people and not looking for anything in return, but just giving back what was given to me those years ago. But it would be nice to think as well, and again, maybe to Carl's point, that this starts to happen in a gender neutral way, that I'm not just supporting other women, but that I can, it can be women or men, but it's about normalizing that space that um, it's not a men versus women thing, but it's everybody, you know, progressing and, developing our industry in this case. Yeah, and I, I think it'll be a, a time move, and I'll put this to you, Carl, when it is normalizing things, when it is seeing somebody like Maeve and uh, running a, a leading sporting, uh, a leading sponsorship agency or Mary June, the umpiring, and getting there is obviously something that's going, we're going to do that in, in time, but until we are there and, and there are lots of people in these roles, there is a uh, a big importance to for men to encourage women along the way to share their experiences because there might not be a woman in that role with with those experiences yeah absolutely i mean it's just human nature we need a reference point um we need to rather than think in terms of concepts we need to be able to you know think in terms and see someone that's doing something that we aspire to um and so you know, you can't underestimate the importance of role models. Um, they're absolutely massive. Um, and, you know, I've been mentored myself. I've been a mentor and I, I continue to mentor other people. And it has huge benefits, um, whether it's male to male, male to female, female to male, female to female, whatever the kind of dynamic or the relationship is that works for each individual. Um, just having some kind of supportive relationship of somebody that can either open pathways for you in a kind of a sponsoring type role or whether it's been able to give you a little bit of a push and a kick when you need it to kind of challenge you and challenge your thinking challenge you know behaviors or, or turn to in times of difficulty you know what people need at a particular moment in their in their life or in their careers is quite different as you kind of progress at different stages so um, I think mentoring and coaching, which are often interchangeable, are really crucial. And again, that's a really good thing that organisations can do to put in place um, to make sure that, that women are in an environment where they feel supported and um, any problems that kind of occur, there's someone that can, first of all, validate those concerns and also help you come up with some solutions of how you can challenge it appropriately and try and you know, change the situation for the better. Mary, I've heard the story about the women or the woman applying for the for the job or looking to apply for the job and seeing the job description and saying, I don't have this, I don't have this, I don't have this, I can't go for it. And then the man looks at it and sees one thing that he has and goes for it. So it just shows that, you know, like men are and women are different and a lot of women do need that little bit of an encouragement to, to go after something. And when you just look at what you did with the umpiring and, and breaking that glass ceiling, was it a difficult thing to do? Um, 
No, I have to say, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I think I've, I've always grown up in quite a supportive environment and um, I think if I was told no, I would have just ignored it anyway, but um, that was just the way I was. But I, I actually, it's um, it's been brilliant in both umpiring in Australia and in Ireland, I have to say, I don't feel held back being a woman at all. Um, and it's a very supportive environment being, you know, 99% male um, being my colleague. So um, I've, I've been, been very, very fortunate um, um, to be, be in that environment. I just, um, I wanted to, to mention something as well um, with with just that help from guys as well. There's a couple, um, if we didn't think Shane Lowry was a big legend already, obviously him adding the 2020 to his top and stuff like that. Um, Micah Richards speaking out in support of Alex Scott. Um, those kind of things are so valuable um, for women's sport going forward. Um, and it's how I, I know Shane, Shane spoke about his little girl. And it's actually how do we get guys who, you know, don't, you know, aren't married or, you know, don't have um, children who are, who are who are female. How do we get those on board? And just how did, you know, how do we find a way just to, for them to think that women's sport matters and it counts and it's a and it's a good product that is the nub of it really you know and, and maybe like you're involved in 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 an area where i'm sure there's a lot of probably data and research gone into it but how do we get to a stage where it is valued the same as men's sport well one example actually just stands out for me so in 2019 when the fifa women's world cup was on so the fifa gaming, so the esports game, they uh, released a version of that that was the women's team. And I have two boys who are, you know, 10 and 7 and they were playing that. And for them, that was what they wanted to play. So that was the World, the World Cup was on. And that, they saw that as normal. And I think the delight for the A sports releasing that as if that is normal. This normalizes everything. So It'll take a little bit of time, I think, for that generation of boys. They're not going to be men for another, you know, few years. But all of those actions normalize it. And I think give it a few more years. And if that really starts to wash through, those those boys who think that's normal will become men. And I'm, I'm very hopeful that it's already washing through and it'll wash through even more over the course of a couple of years. But those specific actions have to be taken to normalize things. Um, and again, maybe like that, that kind of Canterbury Gurley example, but making sure those things don't happen anymore. Yeah, I, I do actually wonder, um, I have wondered quite a lot in the last while when the women's soccer team were having their issues here and, and the women's rugby team were having their issues after the World Cup, why their male counterparts uh, mm -hmm. didn't come out and, and speak for them. And I was always really disappointed to to that we were in a situation that they didn't come out and support them. And, and I do hope, Maeve, that, you know, you're right that the perception will change, you know, and that there is a generation coming through that will be a little bit more supportive, whether it is going to matches or watching it on the TV or standing up and speaking out when, when they really need it to them too. Um, and, and as you said, Mary, like Shane Larry did and, and uh, Micah Richards as well about Alex Scott, like that, that stuff is important and, and they do need to do that to, to help to, to, to force the change and, and to drive it through. And, you know, when we when we look at the, the challenges that we're facing now, I think it's, it's you know, it's, it's going to be such a, a crucial few months and years. And you just hope that, um, you know, we're not in a situation again where we're going to have to, you know, be at these low ebbs with, with women's sport and that, you know, the issues that we face now over the next while will actually just be the, the same issues that are facing men, you know, that it is like a lack of, of sponsorship and, um, you know, it, it's not cases of things where you're, you're fighting to get tracksuits that we have, that we have moved on. And, and um, Carl, when you think about the next few months, what do you think are going to be the biggest challenges that sports have to, to deal with? I think, well, the biggest challenge at the moment is obviously COVID and um, lack of people being able to come together. Just such an uncertain situation um, is, is going to be a major challenge. I think in terms of tangible, real things that are happening on the ground, it's just it's having a big impact on relationships because everyone's you know getting Zoom fatigue and having to com communicate like we are now online and um, 
that's preventing us having some you know real important conversations in some ways where, where we get together and get heads together so i think just the uncertain situation with covid and what the financial implications that's going to involve is going to be um it's going to be huge i think in terms of opportunities that the next a few months will create it it's a chance chance to kind of do something different and it's an opportunity to stand back and reflect on, on where we are now and how actually um you know sport could change and can do things that it's not done before because there's a new environments and and new constraints and i think about you know some of the earlier time in my career when i worked in smaller organizations that didn't have much money didn't have much resources they were some of the most creative organizations i've ever worked with because they had to really think carefully about finance to make it go a long way and think carefully about relationships to get people working together so um i think there'll be massive constraints for sure but those are the opportunities really about creativity and about bringing people together to try and come up with new solutions and collaboration on, is going to be huge as well, maybe when you, when you think about what's coming down the track. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, kind of what, it's also unknown as well. You know, none of us can really predict how much is going to happen in the future. So I think the sports working together to deal with that is going to be really important. And, you know, you mentioned the Federation, I'm on the board of the Federation, but it's, it's those kind of alliances of coming together to tackle the challenges ahead because there's no doubt that the you know the financial challenges are really impacting from club level through to sort of a national level and it's going to be really hard for everybody and you know sports need to work together to to affront that for sure and what about for the players mary um, well, one thing um, I've found from, from COVID is that a lot of sports have managed to figure out how to live stream the sports, which I think is brilliant. Um, and so there's no excuse not to live stream a women's game again. Um, but in terms of um, collaboration, um, I actually am on the board for our Players Association as well, which is, um, it's an interesting space at the minute, but I have to say there's brilliant collaboration around the world. So we come under the, the heading of FICA, which incorporates, you know, Australia, England, and the information sharing and make sharing, making sure that, you know, we're up to date on, on mental health and, and all those kind of things that players need through this time. Um, that's been a brilliant benefit to us in terms of collaboration, but obviously just on the ground as players. I mean, we're going into, into winter for cricket, so it's indoors and plenty of hand sanitizer and, and see where we go from there. It's definitely a, it's definitely a strange time, um, but look, we would just hope, as Carl said, that it will it will bring some opportunities and you know that there will the change will still keep keep happening because it's it's been so strong i think over the last few years that um it would be terrible to see any even drop off on it but um we're just gonna have to wait and see what happens over the next few months so Maeve, carl and mary thanks so much for joining us today i'm a real eye opener i think we got a bit very deep and very serious there but it is a it is a pandemic so i think that's okay and look this brings the uh, brings us to the end of our web series so i'd just like to thank everybody who has joined us over the last few weeks and a special thanks to Ali Nolan as well, because she's done absolutely brilliant work in getting this all off the ground. It hasn't been easy at all because uh, obviously uh, lots of challenges and uh, from a logistics point of view and, and just a, a communication point of view in this new world that we live in, but she's done absolutely uh, great work. So I hope that everybody enjoyed On The Front Foot. It's been an absolute pleasure to host it. Uh, some fascinating guests and real insights and lots of learnings that are gonna be vital over the next few months. So thanks a million to everybody. <laughs>